Hello everyone, my name is Brant Kudrowski and this Organic Chemistry Lab video covers a Diels-Alder reaction experiment. This is part one, the pre-lab. The Diels-Alder reaction is one of the most powerful reactions in organic chemistry. In 1950, the Nobel Prize in Chemistry was awarded to Otto Diels and Kurt Alder for their work on this reaction and therefore it bears their name. It's a reaction of a 1,3-diene, this is the diene component, with an alkene which serves as something called a dienophile and the reaction of these two gives a cyclohexene. Here's how it works in a very general sense. A 1,3-diene reacts with a dienophile, and these come together in a transition state that looks like this, where the dotted lines are indicating where new bonds are going to be forming. The structure here is shown in brackets with a double dagger to indicate that this is a transition state. This isn't an intermediate that you could isolate, but the reaction arranges itself this way on its way from reactants to products. The product then is a cyclohexene which has two new sigma bonds and also the pi bond that's shown over here on the left is also new. This reaction creates two new sigma bonds indicated in red. It also makes a ring and generates up to four new stereogenic centers that occur at the ends of the red indicated bonds in the product. This product has no stereogenic centers but with more complicated dienes and dienophiles up to four new stereogenic centers can form. Some learning objectives for this experiment include performing a Diels-Alder reaction, generating a reactive intermediate in situ, setting up a reflux apparatus with venting, using a mixed solvent system in recrystallization, and reviewing vacuum filtration and melting point analysis. Here's the overall reaction for today's experiment. The balanced equation is shown here. It consists of a molecule called 3-sulfoline, which is also known as butadiene sulfone, reacting with maleic anhydride to give the product, which is cis-1-2-3-6-tetrahydrophallic anhydride. And the other product is sulfur dioxide. Now, one of the things you might find interesting is that there's no diene listed in this particular balanced equation. The 3-sulfoline is going to produce the diene in situ, and that's something that we'll talk about next. Two reactions are occurring in sequence in this particular experiment. The first one is 3-sulfoline thermally cracks to give 1,3-butadiene. That's the diene for the Diels-Alder reaction. That reaction works like this. When 3-sulfoline is heated, the following bonds break, and that reaction generates 1,3-butadiene and sulfur dioxide. This produces the diene in situ, which then reacts with the dienophile. The reason we don't add 1,3-butadiene as a reactant straight away is that it's a gas and it's very difficult to work with. So 3-sulfoline is a convenient precursor to this diene for our Diels-Alder reaction. Step two is the actual Diels-Alder reaction, and that proceeds through something called an endotransition state, which looks like this. The endotransition state is characterized by the diene and the dienophile stacking like this, where one is almost on top of the other. Orbitals on the diene and dienophile are shown here with pink and white lobes, and when they overlap like this, that's where the new sigma bonds form. I've shown here in red something called primary orbital overlap, which is leading to the new sigma bonds. In addition, there are also p orbitals on the other parts of the diene and the dienophile, which I'm indicating in blue. These can overlap in a process called secondary orbital overlap, which helps to stabilize the endotransition state. This transition state is favored over the other possible transition state, which is called exo, because it has this extra interaction that helps bring the diene and the dienophile together and hold them together. It's extra stabilization. That leads to an endotransition state, which is shown here. Here, the dotted lines are indicating partially formed or broken bonds, and the new bond bonds that are going to be forming are indicated with the pink highlight. When those bonds actually form, it leads to the cyclohexene product. This is one picture of the product shown in an edge perspective, and that's equivalent to the following picture, which shows the cis stereochemistry in the final product. One requirement in the Diels-Alder reaction is that the diene must adopt an S-cis conformation in order for it to react. Here's what that means. This is a picture of our diene today, 1,3-butadiene, rotating between two conformations. If you look at the conformation on the left and imagine a dotted line running down the single bond, you'll see that the two double bonds are on the same side of that line. This particular conformation is called S-cis. 1,3-butadiene in an S-cis conformation can undergo a Diels-Alder reaction because it has the right geometry to adopt the required transition state. And the right is another conformation of 1,3-butadiene that's called S-trans. But 1,3-butadiene in an S-trans conformation, which is indicated by this red line, can't undergo a Diels-Alder reaction because it doesn't have the right geometry for the required transition state. Dienes in Diels-Alder reactions must be able to adopt S-cis conformation, and 1,3-butadiene diene has no trouble with that. Diels-Alder reactions are stereoselective. What that means is that if you start with a trans dienophile, you get a trans product. Here's an example. 1,3-butadiene here in the middle reacting with this trans dienophile gives a trans Diels-Alder product. I'll explain what makes each of these structures trans. 
In the Dyena file, if you imagine a dotted line running down the length of the double bond, the two ester groups on the alkene are on opposite sides of that line. That's what makes this trans. In the Diels Alder product, those two esters are pointing in different directions in space. One of them has a dash bond and is pointing away, while the other one has a wedge bond and is pointing up. Pointing in opposite directions means trans. In Diels Alder reactions, cis dienophiles give cis products. Here's an example. In this reaction, the cis dienophile goes to give a cis product. I'll explain what's meant by cis. In the dienophile, the two ester groups are on the same side of an imaginary dotted line that runs down the center of the double bond. And in the cis product, the two esters point in the same direction. Here, they're both pointing down. Now, you have to be careful not to confuse the concept of cis and trans with s cis and s trans. They're separate concepts. The diene in this reaction is in an S-cis conformation. The S stands for single bond, so when you see S-cis or S-trans, it's talking about conformations about a single bond. When you see cis or trans without the S, it's either talking about the arrangement of groups on a double bond or the arrangement of groups on a ring. It's important not to confuse the two. Diels alder reactions always have S-cis dienes, but they may have trans or cis dienophiles. Safety is described on this slide. We'll be working with maleic anhydride, which can cause burns or irritation to tissue. This is a corrosive solid. When you're grinding maleic anhydride, this should be done in a fume hood to avoid dust exposure. We'll be working with petroleum ether, which is actually not an ether at all. It's actually a mixture of alkanes that is volatile, flammable, and an irritant. Avoid contact with the liquid or its vapors. We'll also be using xylene, which is another name for dimethylbenzene. It's flammable and it's an irritant. Avoid contact with the liquid or its vapors. Finally, we'll be producing SO2, which is a noxious corrosive gas. We're going to vent it to our benchtop fume hoods to avoid exposure to it. It has a smell of burnt matches. This slide describes a vented reflux apparatus. A reflux apparatus consists of a flask with a liquid attached to a condenser that's arranged straight up and down. The idea with the reflux apparatus is that we want to use it to heat the reaction, but not remove the solvent. Here the heating source is a heating mantle that's plugged into a variable transformer, and that variable transformer gets plugged into the wall current. In this apparatus, cooling water goes in through the bottom and out through the top, and that helps keep the condenser full of water. It allows air bubbles to escape. And in this particular version of the apparatus, there's a new feature. This part is new. The hose is vented to a benchtop fume hood in this case. And the reason for that is that this reaction produces that SO2 gas, which we don't want to let out into the lab. With this vent, the SO2 gas can vent out of the lab. This slide covers a little bit about the xylene solvent that we'll be using. Xylenes is actually a mixture of three isomers, ortho, meta, and para. These are the structures of those molecules. Ortho is the name of the molecule that has the two methyl groups next to each other on the ring. Metaxylene has two methyl groups in a 1-3 relationship, and paraxylene has them in a 1-4 relationship, opposite each other on the aromatic ring. It is used today as a high boiling solvent in today's experiment. The high temperature provides activation energy to induce the thermal cracking of the 3 sulfalene and it also provides activation energy for the Diels-Alder reaction. Finally, today we're going to be using a mixed solvent recrystallization system. Xylene is actually a very good solvent for the product. So if we used xylene to recrystallize our product, it would never come out of solution. It would stay dissolved pretty much all the time. Petroleum ether is another solvent that's a mixture of alkanes that's a really poor solvent for the product. It hardly dissolves the product at all. When we mix those two together, we can get a solvent that has just about the right characteristics for recrystallization. One that is a good solvent when it's hot and a poor solvent when cold. The idea here is we're going to be adding petroleum ether to a solution of the product in xylene, and that's going to limit the product's ability to stay dissolved. It'll force it out of solution, and we'll get crystals out. We'll purify the product today using this mixture of the good solvent and the poor solvent, which will be just right for the recrystallization. This is the end of the pre-lab lecture. Stay tuned for the next video in the series, which will cover carrying out the reaction and characterizing the product. If you found this video useful, check out the next one in the series or watch the prior video and consider subscribing to my YouTube channel. My name is Brant Kudrowski. Thanks for watching.